our study from the School of Christ on revival, and we're going to leave that right there. Um, just felt early in the mo- early this morning uh, as I was awake praying to, to go a different direction for the next few weeks. So we're going to stop the School of Christ study where we left off uh, last week. And if you would like that study, uh, we have uh, I can give you access to that. Um, I believe we may have some booklets over in the office, any of the School of Christ uh, studies that you would like to have. Several of you have gone through the whole school, uh, but if you would like some of that material, we could probably uh, get that for you. But we're going to look tonight in Exodus chapter 14 and verse number 14. And over the next four weeks, we're going to talk about who we are and what we are as Christians. We are a miraculous people, Amen. Amen. If we're here tonight, born again, that's a miracle. And I'm thankful for that miracle that you and I, if you want to see a miracle, all you have to do is look up. Stand in front of you is a miracle because God has moved time and time again. Uh, God has worked miracle after miracle in my life. And uh, I'm thankful for times that um, when my life could have been taken, that God's miraculous hand intervened. And just so many testimonies of that, I'm sure, through the house. So we are a miraculous people, and we're going to talk about that uh, for the next uh, probably about four weeks. So looking tonight for a text, we're going to look in uh, the whole chapter of Exodus chapter 14, if you want to turn there. But we're going to take one, one verse for text, and that's verse number 14. Exodus chapter 14. And verse number 14. If you will stand for the reading of the text tonight. Exodus 14. Like I said, leave your Bible open there, but we're going to look at verse 14 for our text. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. Amen. Lord, add your blessing unto your word tonight. We'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. This was the instructions that was given to the children of Israel during this time of their lives. We understand that God does not abandon us, right? Instead, He loves us, and He guides us. He never, he never abandons His people. He said, I'll be with you always, even unto the end, He said. J.D. Douglas said, Miracles are events that dramatically reveal this living, personal nature of God, which is active, not a mere destiny, but as a Redeemer who saves and guides His people. I'm thankful that God loves us and He guides us. When we think, how many times have we seen that there seemed to be no way out, right? When there seems to be no way out, God very well may be working a plan on your behalf. You just hold on and you trust Him. When God is intervening in our reality, no matter what anybody else thinks, no matter what anybody else's opinion is, we have to hold to what Solomon said in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. And what is that? Trust in the Lord. Not just trusting in the Lord, but trusting in the Lord with all of your heart. And he went a step further and leaned not to your own understanding. If you're trusting God, you cannot lean on your own understanding. You cannot do both at the same time. You either trust God or you don't. So we must trust all will be well. All might not be well, but we have to remember God's got this and God's got us. It is well. I love the testimony of the Shunammite woman as she comes running to the prophet. Her son is laying dead at the house, uh, and he said, How is it with you? How is it with your husband? Uh, How is it with your son? You know what her response was? It is well. I read that, and I'm like, Your son's dead at home, and it is well? She was speaking of her trust and confidence. Uh, She knew that she had got where she needed to be. Uh, Things were not well when she left the house, but she knew things were well now because she had gotten to the man of God, and he was going to take care of that need. Uh, Why do we do this? We must trust all will be well because we know God knows every back road. 
God knows every curve. God knows every detour along this way. Uh, this way that we're walking, we don't know. Uh, what did Thomas say? Uh, he said, I go to prepare a place for you is what Jesus told him. Uh, and he said, the way you know. And Thomas said, we don't know the way. We don't know. And he said, I am the way. Uh, so every part of that road, every curve, every crook and cranny, if you will, God knows it. Uh, and we've got to remind ourselves of that. Scripture tells us, encourage yourself. Sometimes you've got to talk to yourself. I, I didn't realize this. I probably should have, but we talk about, people talk about prayer, and we know prayer is talking to God. But I heard it put this way the other day, meditation is self-talk. Meditation is you reminding yourself of who God is. You taking time just to sit there uh, and reflect on what God has done and remind yourself, God did it before. He'll do it again. Uh, reminding yourself, God has not left you. God has not forgotten you. Uh, it's good to get an encouraging word from somebody else. Uh, but the psalmist said there's a time that you've got to encourage yourself in the Lord. Uh, so we've got to remind ourselves every day, uh, the Lord is my shepherd. Jesus is my shepherd, uh, and the Holy Ghost is my guide, uh, and the He's walking right beside me. We're not alone. Our Lord already knows the plan of escape. Paul said that he'll be that way of escape that we may be able to bear it. Some people just want out, but God says, I want you to be able to bear it. And we have to know that long before we understand what's next, God knows. One preacher, our general overseer, matter of fact, uh, Bishop Tim Hill said, God's already in your tomorrow. Amen. He's already there. He already knows. He knows, uh, and he cares about what you're going through. So we look here in the book of Exodus, and verse, first nine verses, we find the children of Israel getting a word from the Lord, first of all, in verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they turn and encamp before Paharatoth between Migdal and the sea, over against Balsaphon, before it shall be, before it shall ye encamp by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land, the wilderness has shut them in. This is after Moses had gone back and forth with Pharaoh, let my people go. Yeah, I'll let your people go. No, I'm not going to let your people go. Your people can go, but your cattle have to stay. No, your people can go, but your children can stay. And there was this back and forth. Now they had finally been let go. And Pharaoh would say of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land of the wilderness. There in verse 4 it says, and, he will, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart that he shall follow after them. And I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his hosts, and the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord, and I did so. And they did so. And it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled. And the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people, and they said, Why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? And he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. And he took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with a high hand. But the, Egyptian pursued at, the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and all of his horsemen and all his army and overtook them in camping by the sea because Philaroth, beside Philaroth between Belisophon. Now, the Bible is not just a book of stories. It's this not a good story. We can read it and say, man, that's a good story. But this is an account of something that really happened. Moses, real man, children of uh, Israel, real man, Pharaoh, real man, e Egyptians, real, all of them real people. We can't understand everything about it. We can't understand uh, because it happens in a different context of what we understand. It happened in a different language, a different culture, and many centuries ago. 
So there's a lot of things that we may not understand about this, but we do know is that this text reveals uh, God in his miracle-working power. Uh, We don't understand why it says God would harden Pharaoh's heart. Uh, We don't understand uh, why uh, this would happen and why this encounter would take place. Uh, But remember what Proverbs says, lean not to your own. You don't have to understand. I don't understand why that happened. I don't understand why God... God allowed this to happen or that to happen uh, because he's God and he knows what he's doing, right? Often the enemy or others think we're failing when the truth is we're simply following the Lord and he always knows best. I I told you I'm trying to read a book every week on my fast day and today I pulled out an old one listening to it pilgrim's progress man it was, it's been good i'm about an hour from being done and it talks about this journey that we're on and many times how we think that we're failing uh, uh, our next study in the school of christ was show me the way to zion so if you want to know how to find the way to zion pick up pilgrim's progress and begin to read it for yourself it begins to unfold all the pitfalls and all the struggles and all the hardships along that way uh, we're not failing though god knows best there's tests and there's trials and there's hardships and we know it rains on the just and the unjust we know uh, sometimes we act like when we struggle as christians that we never struggle to the sinners we think man i'll just go back to what i was doing before no no uh, it was much worse we didn't have the comfort and the strength that we have in the lord now uh, we've got to become humble and per- per- uh, begin to appreciate god's wonders and god's miracles if not we'll miss them We'll miss when we're looking for some big uh, explosion kind of miracle. We'll miss the wonders and the miracles that's happening before us every day. Even when you don't see it, he's working. He's working. He has a plan for us even in the midst of the confusion in our lives. Jeremiah said it, didn't he? Jeremiah 29 and 11. I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord. Some commentaries and some uh, say that that says, oh, I know the plans. God's plan is the same. And God's always got a plan. As, as uh, Sister Mila was sharing with her mom from the back seat uh, the other day, she shared that, uh, that God's got a plan for all of us. He has a plan for us. Even when it's, uh, we face confusion and don't understand, he's still got a plan. It seems like it's out of control sometimes, don't it? It's not ever out of God's control. Anything ever taken you by surprise? Well, that beats all I ever saw. Right? You ever said that? That beats all I've ever seen before. I I never, that just, I didn't expect that. God's never said that. God's never said that. Nothing has ever taken God by surprise. I wasn't expecting that. I wasn't expecting them to actually eat that fruit. No. Nothing's never taken God by surprise. He's got a plan. Our enemy can send his armies all he wants to. Uh, Our enemy can send every uh, force that he has to destroy us in the desert of our journey, uh, but God already has a way out. We may look. uh, You just ask the the servant of the prophet. He steps out his front door. He said, uh, sir, we're in trouble. We're encamped about, and the prophet just laughed at him, didn't he? He said, uh, no, go look again. And when he told him to go look again, he said, Lord, open his eyes. Uh, And he seen that he was surrounded, but he saw that God's host uh, had them surrounded. Uh, So when I think I'm surrounded, uh, God's got me surrounded. Uh, When I think that the enemy's got me encamped about, uh, God's got them encamped about. God uh, is always in control. Uh, Oh, we got to take great comfort in knowing uh, See, we struggle with this uh, because we're still trying to hold on to the reins. Uh, if you're struggling and worried about every opposition that comes, uh, I got a message for you. Uh, let go. Let go and let God. Uh, quit trying to have control over your life uh, and trust that God's got it. Uh, he's never led any astray, uh, and he's worth trusting. Uh, God has a way out already. Uh, there's no temptation taking you such as common to man, but God with the temptation uh, will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. What does that mean? You're going to have to go through it. 
You're going to have to put up with some stuff. You're going to have to take some hard knocks. You're going to have to go through some battles along this way. But to understand something, God's got you. He's got you. It's not his will that any should perish. God didn't call us to question the children of Israel, continue to ask, did you bring us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Well, you're probably going to because of your attitude. But God brought you out to bring you in. All right? They didn't die in the wilderness because God didn't give them a promised land. They died in the wilderness because they didn't want to do what they needed. Do you realize how short of a journey it was from where they were to where God was taking them? But God said, you can't go yet. Take another lap. Forty years. Forty years. You can't possess that land yet. That land is not very far away. Uh, think about that. Your promised land is not very far away, but God's not going to let you enter into your spiritual promised land uh, until all of you is gone. Uh, see, he got them out of Egypt. That wasn't the problem. Uh, the problem was getting Egypt out of them. Uh, God's brought us out of Egypt, and he's going to bring some tests and some hardships uh, along the way to make sure all of Egypt is out of us. Uh, it's one thing to give Egypt the high hand and say, I'm out of here. Uh, but it's another thing a few days later think, I want to go back to Egypt. No, that can't happen. So we pick up verse 10. When Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes. And behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. The children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. They said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? This is one of many times that they gave Moses questions like this. Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians that we should die in the wilderness. So this is it. Here they are. They're belly aching and they're complaining, but here's the bottom line. You can't go back. Pharaoh, Pharaoh, I can't think of the song. Sister Gilda can probably think of it. Red Sea's in front of them. Pharaoh's on their back. Oh, can't think of the song, but Pharaoh's behind them. Red Sea is in front of them. We can't move ahead. We can't go backwards. That part of the story, uh, we may not be able to understand the culture. We may not understand the context or the time frame or yeah, the language barriers or anything like that, but we get that. The enemy's on our back, uh, and we're between, uh, oh, the old saying, I'm between a rock and a hard place. Uh, they were between a rock and a hard place. Uh, there was no way that they could go past the Red Sea, uh, and if they went back, they're dead. Uh, we can dive into the sea. We'll be dead. If we go back, uh, we're dead. Uh, there's no way out. This is what we can relate to when we're afraid and confusion takes over. Uh, how could this be? The enemy's hot on our back. Uh, we did what God told us to do. Uh, is that what we begin to do? We begin to get over there in, that, in those fields. Begin to get over there in those emotions. I did everything God told me to do. I'll, I'll leave. Paul does real good at the whining deal demonstrations. I'll let him keep those. <laughs> But I did everything God told me to do, and now look at where I'm at. And they were there telling Moses, why would you bring us out here to die? Man, you should have left us alone. We were fine until you came and messed up. You were fine. Uh, it's like those that's in, in the New Testament, those Pharisees, and said, uh, we, we've never been in bondage to anybody. Our people's never been in bondage to anybody. Uh, well, they must have forgot about Egypt. Uh, and so here it is. We can relate to this. We forgot what we were supposed to know. You ever forgot what you were supposed to know? Every time we think, this is the big one, Elizabeth, right? This is what's going to take me out. I've come this far, and I'm going to die right here. God, God's not going to use me. God can't use me. There's nothing for me to accomplish. You imagine how the disciples felt when they were on the sea, and the last thing that Jesus said to them was what? Let us go to the other side. But on their way to the other side, a storm begins to hinder their progress, and they forgot what they were supposed to know. The Lord said, we're going to the other side. 
So just because a storm came up, they're thinking, man, we were supposed to do great things, uh, but we'll never do anything. Uh, I'm supposed to be heading for a city whose builder and maker is God. Uh, and these people are thinking a promised land flowing with milk and honey, uh, and we hadn't even got just a short way, uh, and we're going to die right here. Uh, how many of us been that way in this Christian What We forgot. Uh, you know why we get that way? We forgot what we were supposed to know. What was we supposed to know? Uh, God God said, I've got you. I'm in control. I'm the one that delivered you out of Egypt. I brought you out to bring you in. We're confronted with the reality of knowing versus the reality of believing. And so our knowledge of God, we have to understand something about knowledge. There's a book knowledge. There's an intellectual knowledge. But then there's a spiritual knowledge. And our spiritual knowledge is this knowing that God is always in control. It's an ever-increasing faith, and it should be an ever-increasing knowledge that we have. And what is that knowledge? We know it's continuing to grow. It's continuing to deepen. It's continuing to mature. If your spiritual knowledge is not growing, if it's not getting deep roots, if it's not maturing, what does it mean it's not getting deep roots? Meaning every wind that blows blows you over. You've got to get rooted. In God's Word. What do I get rooted in? God's Word. It's going to happen through our relationship. It's going to happen through our experiences with Him. At some point in our journey, we're going to be mad with ourselves. Why? Because I don't understand what is going on. And then we blame ourselves. And then we blame others. Because I don't understand what's going on. We even think that something before was better, much like the children of Israel did. Egypt was better than this. Not because it was easier. You think they had it any easier there? They were, they were laying brick, and then when Moses came on the scene, he said, you all must have plenty of time on your hands. So make your own brick and then lay the brick, and still in the same time frame. So we think that something was better. Do you remember how awful the world was? I don't know if you remember how awful it was when God saved you. But I remember the wretch that I was. And I can tell you my worst day as a Christian uh, is far better than any great day that I had in this world. Uh, and to know, uh, see, I've just got this motto that I try to hold to. Uh, every day's a good day. Some's just better than others. Uh, because that's the reality. Uh, that This is the day that the Lord hath made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, does that mean that everything is grand and everything's going my way? Uh, no, but it's going God's way. Uh, and for some reason, uh, God has placed me on this path uh, so we use that to say what spiritual knowledge can I get from this path that I'm on our major fault before God is number one our independence I got this I got it I'm good God we don't call upon him Jeremiah said that they had talked to the people and he said you've committed two evils You've hewn out for yourself cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. You've forsaken God, and you've hewn out for those, yourself those cisterns that can hold no water. So not enough that you said, I don't need you, God. You've begun to try to do it your own way, and you said your way was broken. So once again, we need to let go. We need to cry out to the Lord. And after you cry out to the Lord, wait for something awesome to happen because it's going to. Wait for something awesome to happen. You know what we're waiting? We're waiting for something awesome to happen out here in front of us. That's not what I'm talking about. Wait for something awesome to happen deep down inside of you. Storm's still raging, but I don't care. The enemy's still on my back. Red Steve's still in front of me. So what? Something awesome has happened. There's a deep, settled peace abiding in my heart and in my soul because I know who I trust. Uh, we continue to read in verse 13, And Moses said unto the people, Fear not. And they're saying, What are you talking about, Willis? Pharaoh's on our back. Red Sea's in front of us. You ain't scared, Moses? Fear not. Stand still and see 
the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom you now see today, you shall see them again no more forever. Take a good look at them, because you ain't going to see them again. Then our text, the Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. So Moses is saying, the Lord's going to fight for you. Now stop all that complaining. Stop talking about graves that were not in Egypt. Stop talking about all of that stuff that don't matter much right now. It's not going to get you anywhere. It's not going to change the situation. Have you ever been around a complainer? I'm like, what in the world? How much have you accomplished by complaining? The problem's still there. And now it's just worse because i got to listen to you complain about the problem that's still there. I can't change the problem, but now i got to listen to you complain about something I can't change. Uh, and so we begin to see, and this is what Moses is dealing with here. Uh, he's not dealing with a complainer. He's dealing with a bunch of complainers. Uh, and they're just coming at him from every way. Uh, and Moses said, this would be a good time for you to hush because God is going to fight this battle. He said, but lift up thou up thy rod and stretch out thy, excuse me. And the Lord said unto Moses, wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. But lift up thou up thy rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea and divide it. And then the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. Now, as people of God, we should expect miracles in our lives we should not just expect it well that's just the way it is we got to give god an opportunity to move in our lives we got to give god the final say oh they said i'm gonna die see y'all you can have my easy chair you can have my house you can have my truck you can, i mean we begin to no what did God say? God said, you shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. You're not done until God's done. But the doctor said, but what did God say? Right? So we should expect miracles in our life. The nature of people who have been saved and experienced the hand of the Lord is that we expect miracles in our lives. As his people, we cannot forget that he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all, meaning God is able to amaze us. If he does not still amaze you, you need to get back in an altar. My dad likes to say, if that don't set you on fire, your wood's wet. So if, God, if you're not amazed uh, at the handiwork of God, uh, if you're not amazed uh, at what God is able to do, uh, and if you're not amazed to know uh, that God can just like that suddenly change everything, uh, then we have issues. We know that he is able to amaze us both because we may be able to exalt his name and because our faith is going to grow because of it. He is our provider, Right? He is our provider. My God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So don't just rejoice in what you have. Also rejoice in the wonders of God that you have not yet received. To know that God has a plan. Verse 17, And behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them. And I will get me honor upon Pharaoh and upon all his hosts and upon his chariots and upon his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. When I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. And the angel of God which went before the camp of Israel removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went before from before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. It was a cloud and darkness to them. But it gave light by night to these, so that the one came not near the others all the night. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. Remember that. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand 
and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them to the midst of the sea, even all of Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And it came to pass, and in the morning watch, the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of the cloud, and troubled the host of the Egyptians, took off their chariot wheels, that they drave them heavily. So the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. What was our text? Let the Lord fight for you. Even the enemy recognized we're no match for their Lord. The Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand over the sea. There it is again. Stretch out thine hand over the sea that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians. So Moses was to stretch out his hand for the waters to part. And Moses was to stretch out his hand when God said to for them to come back together. Is that, did I read that correctly? Upon the chariots and upon their horsemen, and Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to his strength when the morning appeared, and the Egyptians fled against it. And the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea, and the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. There remained not so much as one of them. Now is this, once again, you have to determine for yourself, is this just a story in a book? It's just some, that's a, that's a fairy tale, some will tell you. That's pretty good stuff, pretty good creative writing there. No, it's the reality. Moses was a real man, right? Do you believe that? Do you believe this word to be true? So when we believe this word to be true, uh, it's utter amazement. Uh, but I don't know about you. I love reading what God did for Moses. But I know good and well after 30-something years of preaching, uh, when a congregation gathers, uh, they say, Lord uh, and preacher, thank you for telling me what he did for Moses uh, and what he's going to do in the future. Uh, but what I need to know uh, is what this means to me. What does this story mean to me? We understand something. This was a miracle, right? This was a miracle. For this miracle to occur, though, something had to be done by Moses. Remember? Moses, stretch forth your hand. What if Moses would have kept his hand in his pocket? We don't know because he didn't. So we don't have to speculate. Moses, stretch forth your hand. And to know if the people were going to move forward with the sea as the only means of escape, something extraordinary had to happen, didn't it? Miracles are extraordinary or extraordinary. They always begin somewhere, right? In this particular instance, uh, it started with Moses. How many would say to God, Lord, let it start right here. Let it start right here. Let it start right now. Uh, and so we understand uh, that miracles have to start somewhere, uh, whether it's in the hand of the leader, uh, in the prayer closet of a prayer warrior, uh, deep in our hearts in a miserable situation, uh, in our actions which came from the mind of the Lord. Uh, Moses had to stretch out his hand uh, to show that this movement of water uh, was not by chance. It wasn't just a happenstance. It was the man of God responding to the voice of God, and God moved by that action of faith, an act of God working in might to do what? To save his people because he acted upon God's word. Believe what our God can do with all of your hearts, with all of your mind. Love him with all of your strength. And then as you mature in your faith, you'll realize God has good plans for all of us, you included. This is not just left to Moses. This is not just left to Moses. If we're going to see miracles in our lives, we got to respond in faith. We got to move in faith. I'm praying for a miracle right now. I've got a, I've got a torn rotator cuff, and they're telling me, you got to have surgery. I said, I'm not having surgery. They said, it'll just be a quick, easy surgery. I said, yeah, but the recovery stinks, and I don't have time for that. And so last Wednesday, 
I was in so much pain. I was making deliveries, and I was just going down one of these goofy dirt roads out off 217, and I was, I was just in pain, and I was just I was reaching for my aspirin again. I, I've, been, I've been rotating between aspirin and ibuprofen every four hours. I've just been doing both of them. But I did the unexpected to my flesh because I reached over there, and I grabbed that aspirin, but I didn't take it. I chunked it out into the woods. I said, I'm done with that. An act of faith, just as Moses reaching out that hand to that Red Sea, just an act of faith. And to know about an hour or two hours later, I'm like, I wonder where that aspirin landed. I wonder if it could help me about now. Why? Because my shoulders still hurt. But I said, God, I am going to put faith in action. I'm going to believe you. Listen, I'm over seven days later. I haven't touched an aspirin. I haven't touched an ibuprofen. I woke up. Wouldn't you know Sunday morning, I woke up with a headache like you ain't ever seen. All day Sunday, all day Monday had a headache. And you know what flesh was saying? Aspirin knock a headache out quickly. I said, I'm not taking it. So uh, I'm sitting here uh, negotiating with myself and said, well, you said you wouldn't take aspirin for your shoulder. That's for your headache. I need some relief here, flesh. And we ain't going to do it. I don't have a headache tonight. My shoulder still hurts, but I don't have a headache. Act of faith. Act of faith. Stepped in here Sunday night because for several services, not saying the Lord told me to, but I remember Brother Jeremy's testimony how God healed his back. And I felt compelled to have him pray for me. And he, he lathered me up with some oil Sunday. He hooked me up good. He said, sorry about your jacket. I'm like, dude, if that shoulder gets healed, I don't care about that jacket. I'll take it to the dry cleaners. I'll go buy another suit. But just an act, what was that? Another act of faith. Say, God, I believe your word. I believe that you're a healer. I know that the doctor can do it in an hour, but I know you can do it in a second. A millisecond. Uh, And that's what Moses did here. Uh, Moses didn't say, well, uh, we got to figure out, uh, well, if I lift my hand, what's going to happen? A man's hand being lifted don't part waters. Moses didn't try to analyze it, did he? God said, lift your hand. He lifted his hand. So whatever God, I love what Mary told them at the first miracle at Cain of Galilee, Jesus' first miracle. What did Mary tell them? Jesus wasn't even sure if he was going to work the miracle or not. He said, Mom, my time's not yet come. And she just looked, she just bypassed that and looked at and said, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. That don't make no sense. Do it anyway. Do it. And so they did it. Moses said, I don't see how me lifting my hands is going to resolve anything. But the Lord said. So he did it. Verse 29 through 31 But the children of Israel walked upon marshy, knee-deep mud. No, dry land. Get this. If this is not an oxymoron of all oxymorons, jumbo shrimp has nothing on this. Dry land in the midst of the sea. Wow. And the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. Man, I'd love to see that. The Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel, get this, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw that great work which the Lord did unto the Egyptians, and the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. So after the miracle takes place, there's this graphic description of them seeing the Egyptians dead on the seashore. It's an eyewitness account. These drowned Egyptians stand for an old way of life and slavery. He said, you'll see it no more. Not only would they not see this enemy no more, they wouldn't see the uh, uh, these slave drivers anymore. They wouldn't feel the pursuit of Pharaoh and his men anymore. When he said, take a good look at those Egyptians because you'll see them no more today and forever, it also meant you'll never be enslaved by them again. You'll never be in bondage by them again. 
Somehow the sight of those dead bodies was a concrete sign that salvation and a new life for Israel were now assured. Without a doubt, for the people of God, we can identify who performed the miracle. There's no doubt God did it. Moses never took credit for it. God did it. But Moses did obey God, but God did it. When we are at the end of a situation, we can also understand that we're witnesses of God's mighty power. And when you see a miracle, take note of it. When you see God come through in time, on time, every time, take note of it. God did it. You better keep a journal if you have to. Why? Because sometimes we're going to forget what we should know. We're going to forget what we should know. And then some preacher preaches it to us, well, I don't believe that no more. Somebody tries to share it with, I don't believe that no more. But if you will hit refresh and you will pull from your database, when you will pull from your miracles, when you will pull who can tell what God can do, and who can tell what he's done for you? Right? Isn't that what that song says? In the name of Jesus, we have the victory. It says, who can tell what God can do? Everybody can. But who can tell what he's done for you? Right? I don't particularly like sharing other people's testimonies uh, because I don't know the fullness of it. Nobody can share your testimony like you can. And sometimes you've got to testify to yourself. Didn't David do that? He said, why are you cast down? He, he asked himself, "Why God's come through for you time and time again. God is faithful, his promise. We need to do some of that meditating, some of that self-talk, and understand that we've got to be grateful. We should be a grateful people. We're a blessed people. We're a hopeful people. But also when we think about this, be grateful for difficulties, for difficulties. We find, and I can't, her name slips my mind. I should know her name. But she was in the concentration camp with her sister. Grace, you remember? And Frank. She's in that concentration camp with her sister. And there are just fleas everywhere. They're just eating on them and eating on them. She tells her sister, praise God for the fleas. She said, Ann, why would I praise God for fleas? They're biting, they're eating at me. She said, just begin to praise God for the fleas. But you know what the wonderful thing about the fleas were? None of those guards, none of those soldiers would come in there and mess with them because they didn't want to deal with the fleas. So she said, I thank God. I'm grateful for the difficulties because these little flea bites don't compare to what those guards could do to me. So in closing tonight, we need to be grateful for our difficulties. At the great red sea of affliction that you may be facing, see the hand of God in action. Watch as you move, God moves. Be glad. See, see what they thought was a horrible thing as they're running from their enemy. Oh, man, a Red Sea. Never thought to be thankful for the Red Sea. That thought would have never crossed their mind, right? No reason for it to because they couldn't see what God was about to do with this Red Sea. So if you're facing a Red Sea, why don't you just go ahead and thank God for that? It don't make sense, but God's going to use that Red Sea. He's going to use understand something. He said he'll give you... He said that he'll make a door of hope that you may be a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Understand it when you begin to read that verse that Paul writes and you look all around that verse. When you go over in the book of Hosea and it talks about a way out, he said, I will give them the valley of Achor as a door of hope. The Red Sea was the children of Israel's door of hope. They had never thought that. That valley that you're in tonight, friend, is the door of hope. It don't look like it. It don't seem like it. It's, it could be used for evil by the enemy.
But in the hand of God, it's a different situation. Be glad there's a Red Sea. Bless God that there's a fierce and cruel Egyptian that's on your tail. Uh, to know that God has got this. Uh, for there never, if there had never been a Red Sea, uh, there would have never been this victory. Uh, and there would have never been the song uh, that we hear uh, as the children of Israel after this. Chapter 15 opens up with them singing the song that they called the Song of Moses. The Song of Moses. If there wouldn't have been a Red Sea, there wouldn't have been this song. So we need to praise the Lord. Because as Miriam in Exodus 15, 20 and 21, the sister of Aaron and Moses took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and dance. Miriam answered them, Sing ye to the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown in to the sea to know without a trial without a warfare there's never a song of victory man chapter 4 opens up with them thinking this is the end chapter 15 opens up with them singing a song of victory this chapter may have you thinking it's over I'm facing a red sea and the enemy's hot on my trail. I don't know what to do. I don't know which way to turn. But that man of God lifts his hand, and God moves. That prayer warrior lifts that prayer, and God moves. God speaks into your situation, and he has it all under control. Stand with me tonight. Can we just come Just come and take a few moments this evening and gather around these altars? Maybe tonight you'll come with a song or a word of praise on your lips. Maybe you'll come tonight and say, there's no need for me to bow because I want to praise him. And you just come with hands raised. Or maybe you need to just get on your knees and surrender some stuff to God. However you feel that you need to do it. I never say come to this altar and approach this altar however you feel comfortable because it's not about our comfort. But it's approaching this altar however you feel that God is directing you to do so. If you've got to praise, come praising Him. If you need to fall on your knees or fall on your face or you need to pace the floor, you do that. But we understand as we gather, we know that God has delivered us from the oppression of the enemy time and time again. Praise Him because He's given you the sweet comfort of the Holy Ghost in the midst of every tribulation you face. Praise Him that He said, I'm right here with you. I'll never leave you, forsake you. I'll be with you always, even unto the end. Even when we're saying, where are you, Lord? Lord's silent, it seems. He's right there. How do you know he's right there? Because he's not a man that he should lie. He's not slack concerning his promises. Well, why can't I hear him? Why can't I feel him? You have to take that up with him, but I can guarantee you, he's here. He's here. He hears your prayer. He hears your cry. When will God move in his time? Not ours. When will God move in my situation? When he's ready. But you've got to be ready when he's ready. Right? Heavenly Father, we come before these altars tonight thanking you that we are a miraculous people. And we've experienced miracle after miracle. Miracles upon miracles you've blessed us with. Time and time again, you've showed up in time, on time, and we can say every time. Each one of us who've served you any amount of time has faced some tests, but we've come out of that test with a testimony. But maybe we're in a test. Maybe we're in a trial right now, and we have to understand, too, you're going to make this trial a blessing. As the songwriter said, though it sends me to my knees, and though my tears flow like a river, I know that in you there's sweet relief. So I'm putting all my trust in you. I don't understand. I don't know why it's happening. don't know why I'm going through this particular situation or this particular circumstance. But I trust that you do, God. And I put my confidence in you because you cannot and you will not fail me. Because you said that we're going to the other side. So we're going to keep pressing towards the goal. Keep pressing towards the mark of the prize of the high calling, which is in you, Lord. We just thank you for this opportunity to gather around these altars and to praise you. Gather around these altars and cast all of our cares upon you. Whatever we need to do, we have an opportunity to do it tonight in this altar service. And we thank you for that privilege. In Jesus' name.